Thank you, Judy. Good morning, everyone. Judy was just playing for us first, How Great Thou Art, and then she played the song we'll be singing as an opening hymn, which is on 188 of your hymnal. And it's so good morning. Welcome. It is the seventh Sunday of Easter. It is May 16th in year B. We have a few announcements we'd like to make this morning. So as Heather makes her way up here, I just want to make, before we go too much further, I just want to talk about this couple here. Sometimes we hesitate to tell our stories, but I want to just encourage you again to understand how important it is to share your story. This picture is so important to my friend Callie. These are her parents, and actually my friend is Pastor Callie, my home church pastor, and she describes this picture as the beginning of a love that birthed years of love. And she goes on to tell the story about Donald and Jerice. They were both Clotho kids who became engaged on the evening Jerice returned home from her senior class trip in 1951. Donald picked her up, and she was excitedly telling him about the beautiful engagement ring that Dennis Johnson had given Alice Klausman. Donald said, like this one? He pulled out the engagement ring from the glove compartment And that was the beginning of forever. They were married May 10th, uh, 1952. Like Callie, I am so appreciative of the stories, the legacies, the legacy of Donald and Jerice, left for their children, but also left for all of us. And I want you to know that your stories are important and you are important. Your imprint on the lives of those around you is important. Your life is important. As we go forward, I'm going to be reaching out to you, yes, you, and I'm going to be asking for your stories. I hope you will be amenable to sharing with me and maybe some pictures too. Our stories matter. Our stories are what give shape and relevance to our life together in community. Our roots grow deep into the soil of today's reality for our children and for all of those that come after us. So I hope you'll join me in that. Jesus, God incarnate, the anointed and uniquely born Son of God, believed in the great power of prayer. Throughout the Gospels, we find Jesus journeying to faraway places at early hours of the day to pray. Today in the Gospel, in John 17, you're going to hear Jesus' prayer for God to do with his life what God wills. Then he prays for his disciples. He prays for God's provision, direction, and protection to guide them. Later in this same passage, Jesus prays for us. Yes, even for us who were not yet born. We were inscribed upon the heart of the Holy One. What great love and what honor it is to be ushered into the room where Jesus is praying. Please listen today to the Gospel of John in chapter 17. Creating space for us. Listen to Jesus' words in the Gospel. And let God speak to your heart that you may be fertile ground for the power and the testimony of God's holy word. So as we center ourselves, it is a reminder for us that even though we come to Christ broken, we are made whole. We do not fear the pain of all these seemingly impossible realities of humanity because God is with us. We can give our fear over to God Let the weight of fear fall back into God's creation. God will reveal new what has been destroyed. So please join me in this chant, in this center. Fear not the pain. Let its weight fall back into the earth. For heavy are the mountains. mountains. 
Heavy are the seas. Heavy are the seas. Breathing in the love of God and breathing out all your anxieties. Join me in the call to worship. Jesus Christ has ascended into the heavens and sits at your right hand while we are down here laboring, doing the best that we can to survive. We are keeping our heads above water, but God forgive us. Sometimes drowning seems to be an answer. Keep our faith and trust in you in spite of how we are being treated. We are abused, misused, and accused. For this reason, we understand more and more that this world is not our home. And we are just strangers passing through the night. We are your children, and we need you to help us so that our feet won't slip and our faith won't waver. We believe in you and trust in your holy word. Do it, God. Do it today. God, help us. Please join us in our opening hymn, Christ is the World's Light, number 188 in your hymnal. Prayers of the people. just be at work in those prayers. Lord, in your mercy, all these things in your name. Amen. Maybe grab your hymnal and turn with me to 889 at the very back. Let's just pray that together as we close our prayers of the people. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus who came as a ransom for all, to whom we testify. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Our readings today are from Acts. We continue in Acts. We will be hearing from Psalm 1. And we will also be continuing in 1 John chapter 5. Good morning. Okay, try it again. Good morning. Thank you. That's good to hear. It's nice to hear the people out there. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, together with the crowd, numbered about 120 persons, and said, Friends, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit through David foretold concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us to his resurrection. So they proposed two, Joseph called Barasabas, and I didn't pronounce that right, who was also known as Justice and Matthias. Then they prayed and said, 
Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in his ministry, an apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the eleven apostles. Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by the streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do they prosper. The wicked are not so. They are like chaff the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And from the Gospel, 1 John 5 through 9 through 13. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you will have eternal life. Our gospel today is from John chapter 17, verses 6 through 19. I just wanted to situate the gospel a little bit for you. In chapter 13, Jesus foretells of Peter's denial. So just so you understand what's around this this gospel today. In chapter 14, Jesus says, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. And in chapter 15... Jesus says, if the world hates you, be aware that it hated me before it hated you. And then in chapter 16, Jesus says, when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Today, or this week on our Facebook Live, we talked a lot about the word joy and rejoice. And I just wanted to anchor today's gospel in what's around it, because right after chapter 17, which we're going to be reading today, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus happens in chapter 18. So just to familiarize you a little bit with how the gospel story goes in John. The gospel according to John 17, 6 through 19. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them. And they have received them and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. 
While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may also be sanctified in truth. Word of God, word of life. Okay, kiddos. So we're going to do something a little bit different today. So instead of... Here, Charlie. Can I help you? There you go. Good job. Oh, you're, you're really good at those steps. You guys make a circle? Okay, very good. You got the vine. Okay, now, look at this piece of paper. Do you remember this paper from last week? What did, you, did you say some bad something mean to it? Okay, okay, so let's look at that. So if this sits here, let's put that there. Now... Let's say something, somebody say something mean to that paper. Nobody can hear you because we're outside. They can only hear me. Oh, step. Okay, no, you've got to let go of the vine. I'll give it to Audrey. Now repeat after me. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm, please, God, forgive me. Good job. Here, now you get back in the circle. Okay. Now somebody else try say, saying something mean to that paper. Yeah, okay, and then you've got to let go of the vine. Now repeat after me, Lucas. I'm sorry, God, please forgive me. Awesome, put him back on the vine, guys. Okay, good job. Anybody else want to give it a try? Okay, go ahead, Sawyer. It's supposed to be paper. Oh, break away, break away from the vine. All right, now repeat after me. God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Okay, grab the vine. Okay, so what do we learn from this exercise? Yes, Morgan, go ahead. But what happens if we do? Because we're human, so we're, it's probably likely we might say something mean sometime. What can we do if we do that? Yeah, we can say I'm sorry and ask for forgiveness, because guess what? Did this vine ever leave? Was it always here this whole time? Even when we were saying mean stuff, it was here? Yeah, well, Jesus is like that. Jesus is the vine. Jesus never goes away. So we can always ask forgiveness. And guess what? Jesus always forgives us. All right? All right, can you guys help me pick up this stuff and come back in? Good job. Sometimes you just need to get outside on a sunny day and talk about God. I hope we do that often. We're also talking a little bit about Project Hope, and we're staying in the collection for Project Hope. Um, Our treasurer isn't here this week. So right now we are at 175 and our goal for Project Hope is 475. So if if you can and you have the capacity, we're hoping to replenish the funds for Project Hope, which feeds uh, families in our ACGC school district. So right now we're at 175 and we're working with we're working with Pastor Krista Forsyth Church, Emmanuel Lutheran. We're working with Atwater United Methodist Church. And then we take December and January when we disperse those meals. We plan them and we purchase them. We pack them and we deliver them. May the words of my mouth and the of all our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord. 
Amen. That's so scriptural to me to bless the message before I speak it because my hope is that it comes across as it should for each and individual each individual person. First John four nineteen. We love because God first loved us. Last week was Mother's Day. We said that even though it was Mother's Day, the emphasis of worship was not on any human being, but whether but a real but whether a reality or an ideal, but it was on Jesus the Christ. And that therefore the emphasis of the message, no greater love from last weekend, was on the person of Christ and the life he lived and the gift he gave. And that if you can see that the love reflected in your earthly parents is there, then indeed you are duly blessed, right? We are called each day to celebrate the love that has been poured out on us. 1 John 4.19 We love because God first loved us and to strive to exemplify this love in our lives. Why do we do this? Why do we strive to exemplify this love in our lives? Because we are gods. You heard it today in scripture, in gospel. We're not owned by this world. This world does not own us. We are the beautiful, beloved children of God. No matter what age you are, you are a beautiful, beloved child of God. We belong to God. And striving to stay in relationship with God, staying close to God, you heard the kids, it's a lot of work, right? We're going to say bad things sometimes. We're going to do bad things. But Christ is the vine, and that vine is always here, waiting for us to come back. God never leaves us. I asked you these questions last weekend. How do you encourage acts of loving? How do you shape a life of loving in a difficult world? What has changed about signs of love in this new pandemic, hopefully post-pandemic, world? What do you notice about people? when you're out and about. And I left you last week with this quote from Mother Teresa. Not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. I heard that today when Eileen came up here to read. She stretched herself out to you and asked you to be in that space with her, asking again to say, good morning. Right? Right? Good morning. I mean, sometimes when we put ourselves out there, we are made vulnerable. But it is when we are made vulnerable that we feel the love of Christ so much more intensely. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to tell your story. Now, we heard testimony today. You heard me testify about Jerice and Donald and their love. We heard Jesus' prayer, or almost like a testimony. These people, just like me, Lord, are not of this world. Protect them. They are yours. I am yours. You are mine. So let me share one more story with you this morning. Now, in your bulletin, you got the first part of it. I did that so that I, so you could sort of get a little bit of an intro. So if you didn't get the first part of the story, just take it home with you. I have extra copies. What I want to share is one more testimony of how our roots, or roots, depending on where you're from in Minnesota, <laughs> grow deep in the soil of today's reality by sharing your story with one another. This story is a story of hope, despair, love, Resiliency in the face of desperate times. This is the story of Ron Ivey's grandfather. It is his story because he shared it, but it is now going to be all of our story because he shared it. And frankly, I think it answers the question, which I don't know about you, I get this a lot, why church? Why do we go to church? And why is communing with one another such an incredibly important part of church for us, fellowship. After World War II, 
His grandfather came back to Oklahoma from his Navy service in the, Pac in the Pacific. He married Ron's grandmother, and they settled down in a town called Enid in Oklahoma, the crossroads of wheat country in the northern part of the state. Miles away by nine massive grain elevators, it, it was recognized mostly because of the grain elevators in that town. There were like nine massive grain elevators. Concrete cathedrals dotting the horizon, modernist French architecture called these American grain elevators the first fruits of a new age of engineering and machinery. I think we can relate to that here being from the Atwater, Rosendale area, right? Granaries have been a staple or were a staple for many years. His grandfather went to work at the Pillsbury grain elevator as a truck loader loading bags of wheat into the company's transport trucks at the base of the elevator. It was not a glamorous job, but his hard work paid the bills and put food on the table for his growing family. The job gave his family enough stability to buy a small house not far from the elevator. He enjoyed the camaraderie with his fellow workers, and it was a steady job that the community gave him. A dignity absent from his earlier itinerant life, which if you read the beginning of that story, you know his youth was very itinerant. But then came the 1960s, when Pillsbury further modernized the elevator and his grandfather was laid off. The engineering that created these fruits of a new age, well, now it made him redundant. So guess what? He was out of work. Without an education, he struggled to find employment. His life took a downward spiral of anxiety, alienation, depression. He became a shell of a man. The trauma of his previous privations during the Dust Bowl years resurfaced. For the next decade, 10 years, a dark cloud set over his person and spread to envelop the whole household. He turned inward, and a void set in. For most of Ron's dad's teenage years, now remember, because we're talking about his grandfather, but Ron's dad, his father, was the strange man who wandered aimlessly around their neighborhood. In my parents' wedding photos, he says, my grandfather looks gaunt and bony, with hollowed eyes darkened by shadowy circles and an expressionless face. The shame and the loss of his father's spiritual presence created a void in Ron's father's heart as well. Painting of a greenhouse with wild vines in front is what you see here because it's part of the story. Ron says, my grandfather's journey is a common phenomenon in our human experience. At various points in our lives, we can lose our rootedness in reality especially in times of hardship, like the loss of a job. The need for roots, the French philosopher says, to be rooted is perhaps the most important and least recognized need of the human soul. It is one of the hardest to define. A human being has roots by virtue of his real, active, and natural participation in the life of a community which preserves in living shape certain particular treasures of the past, if you spent any time looking at any of the walls of this church, you must relate to that, right? Treasures of the past live on their legacy here in this church family. Ron Ivey goes on to say that his grandfather was no longer participating in the life of his small town. He had become a stranger to his community, his family, and even to himself. But when Ron's father became an adult, he decided to do something to help his grandfather. He would build a greenhouse with his father. Together they designed and constructed it in the backyard. So this is Ron's father helping his father, Ron's grandfather, build a greenhouse. In this greenhouse... His grandfather grew all types of plants, spider plants, aloe vera plants, elephant ear plants, and they gave them to neighbors around the community. And in the winter, he grew starter plants for an expansive vegetable garden of tomatoes, okra, because we're in Oklahoma, guys, green beans, and potatoes. 
As his grandfather's hands worked the soil, he claimed the dignity of work again. Cultivating these plants together with his son brought him back from the brink, back to life. Their relationship, marked by deep pains and grievance, might never be perfect. And I know we all have those in our lives with our family, right? Our relationships aren't perfect. But somehow it restored it out there in the backyard, inside this greenhouse, roots grew deep into the soil of his reality. Our lives are defined by what we love and care for, what we give attention to. Our lives are defined by what we love and care for and give attention to. When Ron's grandfather discovered his love of gardening in the greenhouse, he stopped defining his life by his past failures and his fears of future catastrophe. The depression faded, and although it might not be gone, it lost its debilitating power. He had found his place in community again. At his local church, a lifeline for his wife and daughter during the dark days, he volunteered and reciprocated the love he had given the community. I'm sure that many of you can relate to this story. We have times of hardship in our lives. And when we come together in community, when we show each other love, when we give attention to what we love and care for, it thrives and lives. So just like we are coming out, emerging from this pandemic, if we can show each other how much we love and care for one another, if we can share our stories with one another and give attention to one another, we will come back from all of this trouble, this divisiveness, this polarization, the loss of jobs, economic hardship, and we'll feed each other. Yes, in potlucks, I hope, (laughs) but in other ways too. Peace be with you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I think we'll begin passing the offertory plate in a couple of weeks. Um, At this point, it's still on the back table. I heard that there's a thing called the noisy offering, so I'm going to let the Sunday school teachers uh, figure out how we do that. I guess I've never done that before, but I hear it has something to do with noisy pails and kids and fun stuff. So So let's just pray a prayer of blessing um, over all of our offerings in ever-present God who speaks in thunder and earthquakes and in the softest whisper. We long to hear your voice over all the noise of the world this day. In a world so divided and polarized, we need to hear not only the voice of the shepherd, but the cries of other sheep who are being marginalized, forgotten, and abandoned. May the gifts we offer today be our response to hearing the one who speaks in the language of love and compassion. In God's holy name, amen. Please join me in the doxology. Let us join together in today's benediction and blessing. Let us go forth into the new seasons of our lives. 
Let us go with caring awareness for the world and all that is in it. Let us go forth in peace and be led out in joy. With the power to love and the strength to serve. Amen. Please join us in Baptized in the Water. It's 2248 in the Little Black Hymnals.